Thank you very much, uh, Dean Fried. It's a great honor to be here. First of all, uh, it's obvious from the sounds in the audience how productive you all have been. And I want to congratulate you for being risk takers. You're all risk takers. Uh, and I think you're taking a risk at a remarkable time uh, in, in our transformed uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare effort. What I'd like to do today is to give you what I personally, and this is biased, but I personally think is a glimpse into the future um, and, and uh, what I think is, uh, is going to represent at least the functional outcome uh, for a huge uh, amount of our health care provision and health care payment over the next, uh, next five to ten years. How that happens is not necessarily going to be templated uh, like, uh, like uh, we've templated at Geisinger, uh, but I think that the functional outcome is, is what you have to uh, look at. We have a particular, we have a particular uh, organizational uh, advantage and fiduciary advantage in that we have both payer and provider essentially working for the same uh, directors. And that allows us to create a sweet spot where both on the insurance side and on the provider side we can ask questions about improving care for v various cohorts that we're responsible for, whether they're hospital-based care giving cohorts or whether it's ambulatory care. And then the question is, if, if there's a way of re-engineering that care and getting to a more optimal short-term and long-term outcome, is there also a cost advantage? So that's what these three balls mean, basically. Now, we're not as, uh, we're not as closed as Kaiser. We're heterogeneous, so we reach out to 25,000 non-employed, uh, non uh, non-Geisinger uh, providers. Uh, we reach out to 12 hospitals that are not part of the Geisinger system. So if we do something that's very innovative in that core, we can then ask questions about whether it can be taken out to the much more usual kind of market where there's not a direct connection to the total cash compensation and, and the payment incentives for the providers. So it's a very interesting model. We're designed, uh, we're in the boonies, basically. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure you could do this in the city, um, and it gives us a huge advantage. We're we're in in in, in post-industrial and rural Pennsylvania, and we've basically through a consolidation process in the market, both on the insurance and the provider side, got great market share on both ends of the of the spectrum, and we've designed our program as a hub and spoke. So, in order to take care of patients close to where they live. We will admit them to uh, actually non-Geisinger hospitals unless they need to come to one of the hub hospitals for specialty, subspecialty care. And obviously the hub hospitals are very expensive, and those hospitals that are not dealing only in that high intervention, high severity care are less expensive and less anxiety uh, prone. So it's, it's a concept of trying to be centrifugal in care, getting patients cared for close to where they live rather than sucking them in to a very high anxiety, high expense uh, hub, unless we have to. The entire system uh, covers about 70 sites, a uh, tremendous number of outpatient sites ranging in size from one or two docks up to 30 or 40 docks, depending upon the population. Uh, that, uh, that the area serves, and it's completely electronic. So this entire area is electronic with one electronic health record, which is EPIC. So again, we have the information systems on the payer side, on the, on the insurance side, and we have one electronic system uh, on the provider side. Plus, about 12 years ago, we reached out to what now represents 3,000 non-Geisinger physicians where we've put portals, web-based portals, to our electronic record in their offices. So regardless of whether they're part of our employed system or not, they have access and utility for the same electronic record, which is, which is an incredibly important feedback of real-time data if we're going to change how we care for patients. It's expensive. Uh, we, we spend about 4.4 percent of our annual revenue, which this year is budgeted to be about 3.4 billion, 4.4 percent on the annual upkeep of our electronic health record. So obviously it has to be highly uh, utilized and, and highly effective in order to justify that. But we could not do what we've done without feedback of real-time data 
in a, in a way that's immediately usable in order to alter how care is given and in order to see whether your alterations are actually having the effect that you want. We also have made a commitment to reach out to as many of our active patients and have them connected to us either exclusively or predominantly electronically moving away from once every six month office visit or once every year office visit or telephonic connection. And we're up to probably about 40%, 30 to 40% of our active patients, a little over 200,000 dealing with us electronically. We think that that's going to be a much better predicate for getting getting them really involved in either their health maintenance uh, or their active uh, care getting uh, if they have chronic disease. This is, um, this is the priority set by our, our board of directors. Um, and when we talk about quality, we're not talking about checking off a box for the Department of Health uh, or the Joint Commission or on the insurance side for NCQA, the National Quality uh, Association or HEDIS, we're talking about fundamental re-engineering of care. And that is our top priority. And we pay the men and women who are our full-time doctors up to 20% of their total cash compensation for achieving goals that are directly connected to quality and innovation. So up to 20% of how we pay them is not dependent upon seeing more patients or having increased panel size or doing more RVUs. And that's a very important thing to understand how we've accomplished what we've accomplished. And here's what we're fighting. We believe that uh, in general, uh, we are immersed in unjustified variation for the care that we give. And a lot of that immersion is justified by the religion of individual doctor-patient interaction. And we think a lot of that religion is unjustified. So we have been looking to see how much variation in caregiving uh, can, really be, um, can really be transformed to default, default best practice. And what effect will that have on outcome and cost? Um, most systems do not have continuum of care from primary care to hospital-based specialty to highly specialized uh, um, uh, care for, uh, for transplant or for cancer care or for uh, neuro-oncology, what have you. We have the entire continuum, plus we have the insurance company. So that second dot is something that we can directly, uh, directly attack. You probably are aware that most of how we get paid over the last 35 years, 40 years, has been payment for performance of a particular unit of work, widget-type payment. And again, because of the fact we have both an insurance company, i.e. a payer and a provider, we're able to vary that to look at payment for getting an acceptable outcome over time. And that's a very, very interesting predicate for a lot of the innovations that we've, we've done. And I think up until recent um, uh, efforts uh, by, uh, uh, by CMS, uh, Medicare and Medicaid Administration, by the Innovation uh, Division of CMS, uh, and it's buried within the ACA. Up until recently, there have not been incentives to fundamentally innovate care. There are now incentives. The question is, uh, are they strategic? Will we have metrics to determine whether they've actually worked or not? So where do we want to be? I would, I would suggest that both ethical and, and financial considerations would lead us to affordable coverage for all. I believe it's ethical. Uh, to, uh, to do that uh, as a nation. But even if you don't buy that, there's a business rationale for affordable coverage for all. I believe we should move to payment for value. I believe we must insist on coordinated care. And probably the toughest dot of all uh, on, this, on this list is continuous improvement and innovation. Outside of a formalized, randomized clinical trial, which is a very systematic methodologically pure way of deciding whether a new treatment is better than an old treatment, we need to learn from every caregiving episode that we perform. And we have at least, we at least theoretically, we have the capability of getting that information now that we're moving to electronic, uh, electronic uh, aggregation and data warehousing. But we need to create a sociology where, as a system, even without having patients in randomized clinical trials, we can 
assume that everything we do we'll learn from and continue to improve, and we have to incent for that. And then obviously the fifth goal is, is my own uh, personal uh, fantasy. There are, there are two uh, fundamental parts of our religion. One uh, comes from a very interesting article, which for me was seminal. Uh, it was written uh, by the Rand Corporation. Uh, Beth McGlynn was the first author, 2003. And what it said uh, was that about 50% of the time, the care that was given, as determined by a panel of experts, was either too much, too little, or wrong. Now, now let me just uh, focus on this. So we're representing one-sixth of the economy of the United States in healthcare. And just think, even if you discount that 50%, figure, let's say it's only 30% because there are methodologic quibbles about how they did their study. What if 30% of one-sixth of our economy was cost without benefit to the people that we are serving? Now for me, that's an incredible upside. That's an incredible upside. And what we've been trying to do with our road tests is to see if we can extract as much of that 30% of unhelpful or sometimes harmful care, and will it actually do two things? Will it help the quality outcome, and of course, will it decrease cost? And for a large amount of our system, then we can decide what do we do? How do we redistribute that captured value? So this is a seminal part of the, this is the underpinning for what we're doing. The second underpinning came from Arnie Milstein's uh, slide here, which back in the 90s, early 90s, uh, began to uh, show, and, and there were other studies uh, that showed the same thing, there was no relationship in this country when you looked at various markets between the cost of care and the quality of the outcome. That's what this slide shows, complete chaos, complete random, no, no relationship at all. We have subsequently move to believe that there's actually an inverse relationship, not all the time, but most of the time, if you look at the highest cost parts of our population, whether it's hospital-based uh, treatment cohorts or whether it's ambulatory uh, cohorts, most of the time the highest cost will relate to the worst outcome. Now, if you, if you buy that, if you, if, you, if you begin to show that that's true, not 100%, but most of the time, it takes away this false polarity between attacking cost as what's driving you versus helping human beings, because they're the same thing. If you can re-engineer care and you can, let's say, attack variation and extract some of that 30%, which is not helping patients and may be hurting them, the question is, are you doing two things? Are you actually improving their outcome as well as decreasing cost. And in fact, more and more people are coming to believe that, and, and we began to see this in a number of our uh, innovation uh, experiment road tests uh, starting about six or seven years ago. These are the general categories of our innovation. The first is, uh, is the acute hospital-based care that was redesigned, again, trying to attack unjustified variation. Uh, we packaged it as a single price, including us taking responsibility for treatment of any complications that would occur within 90 days, regardless of their cause. We thought we'd, and that, that got, that was pretty, you know, that was pretty attention capturing for our own men and women. And it also captured a lot of attention outside. That was, that was called the warranty. Um, and, and the question was, if we looked at hip replacement, knee replacement, heart surgery, um, cardiology intervention, uh, gastric restriction for morbid obesity, perinatal, the whole nine-month perinatal episode, uh, if we looked at erythropoietin treatment, and if we redesigned it with a default best practice using either, either evidence-based or consensus from outside of the institution, discipline, usually discipline-based, or if we just created a sociology where we looked at at an inventory of our variation and forced consensus for best practice for every step along the way from diagnosis to rehabilitation. Number one, could we do it? And number two, how often could we do it? Number three, 
what effect would it have on outcome and what effect would it have on cost? And as I say, we've, we've now uh, spread this out to a huge number of hospital-based interventions and peri-hospital treatments. We started with elective heart surgery. This was published in 2006. It's sustainable. Uh, and we basically said for every patient who is getting this care in our hospitals, we would do, in the case of heart, I think 50 best practices for every one of those patients. In real time, defining that, that all of the blocking and tackling that had been looked at in various studies would be baked in to the entire episode, would be put into our EHR so that we had real time feedback, not, not three months after the fact chart review, but real time feedback. And what we found was we got a good result before we actually did this, because we started with a good result. I didn't want to take a chance on a real, you know, a real bad uh, result uh, getting worse. We started with a good result, and we actually saw improvement. So good got better. And this has been sustainable now over, over six years, and we saw a decreased cost. So the hospital contribution margin also increased. Uh, and our health plan basically was able to get a better deal. And, and part of that value that was produced had to be passed back to the buyer. So in our area, most of our buyers in commercial uh, are small companies, and they are critically sensitive to the premiums that, uh, that we offer. So that was an interesting start. We've now carried this out to this portfolio of hospital-associated or hospital-based uh, uh, care. Uh, and we've consistently showed, we've consistently showed that, that um, when you do the re-engineering, some of it's easier, some of it's harder, um, the, the per proven perinatal, which is nine months, has about 150 best practice goals that have to be achieved. So it's, it's, a, it's a real humdinger. But we've basically shown that uh, when you look at metrics of quality, for the proven perinatal, you're talking about C-section rate, you're talking about frequency of admissions to the neonatal ICU, um, you're, you're talking about uh, you know, elective uh, uh, early term, uh, um, and it's just, it's amazing how you get increased quality as well as decreased cost. And, and why, you know, why, why should that be surprising? In every other complex task that has been looked at in a formal way, if you attack unjustified variation, you do two things. You increase quality and you decrease cost. Now, the pushback among the professionals would be they're turning us into robots. We're practicing cookbook medicine. But it's very easy to deal with that if you have the right process and the right sociology. And that is, you basically say to your men and women, you can deviate from this whenever you want to. Whenever there's an individual reason to deviate, deviate. You just have to justify it to your, uh, to your brothers and sisters. And you have to justify it in, uh, in real time. And one acceptable justification is not, I was trained this way 35 years ago. Um, and, and another unacceptable justification is, I've had a message from God. So it's, it's, been, it's been very interesting. The second uh, issue that, uh, that I want to just review briefly is our approach to taking care of patients with chronic diseases. Most of our patients uh, who are in this particular part uh, of, uh, of the country are older, sicker, and poorer than just about any demography outside of the Deep South. Uh, the average age of the patients that we're taking care of is, is uh, somewhere around 65 to 70. The patients that we started our version of Advanced Medical Home with are average age 72. They have four chronic diseases, and they're taking about 20 pills a day. There's, they're the highest utilizing patients. They're the patients that come in and out of the hospital every 30 days. And we assumed that that was a sign, number one, that we weren't giving the kind of care that would be considered optimal. And it was also very high cost. So we created an innovation potential from the community practice leadership up. This is not top down, but community practice up. The 20% of their pay, 20% of how we reimbursed our men and women, would be based not on panel size, not on number of patients seen, but would be based on how, uh, whether or not, and how quickly they could get 
25,000 of our type 2 diabetic patients hitting every one of what was felt to be critical goals for long-term best outcome for the care of diabetes. And as you can see, when we started, uh, the vast majority, in fact, just a minuscule number had every one of nine best practice goals achieved. And then over a period of time, by re-engineering the care, looking at the electronic record, what have you, a tremendous increase. Um, so that I would say 99% of our type 2 diabetics now have seven, eight, or, or all nine, but seven, eight, and nine of these best practice goals achieved. And a number of these goals are, are not indicated. For instance, this level of A1C, which is perfect diabetes control, if it's below seven, you just don't push that if you have a patient who's got heart disease who's over seven. So there's, there's contraindications to a number of these. So the question really was, what good would that do? And remarkably, in 600 days of steady state, when these patients were taken care of in this way, there was a significant decrease in the risk for amputation, for myocardial infarction, for stroke, and for retinopathy. And, and to me, that is remarkable. 600 days is not a long period of time where if you change the kind of care that's given, you're actually getting a change in the long-term chronic disease outcome. Now, we haven't even done the economics on this, but you can bet that when we do the economics on this, you'll see that the cost has also gone down dramatically for that 25000 And then the last thing is, is our... Is our um, Use of data and analytics from the payer side, the insurance companies do things that the providers will never do well. The providers obviously do huge numbers of things that the insurance companies will never do well. And our sweet spot is an attempt to actually um, cross that barrier. And so one of the things that we did is we took the insurance company's data and the insurance company trained and paid nurses and embedded them in our community practices, in our, in our 40 or, or 45 sites. And they brought the data in to let the doctors know who were the patients that needed to have special attention. It was basically concierge care for the sickest. And it was based on not the richest, but concierge care for the sickest. And each nurse had 125 to 150 of the sickest patients in, a, in the given practice and nothing could happen to those patients unless it was triaged through that nurse. So that nurse was the general manager of the patient. And the question was, would we successfully benefit those patients with four or five chronic diseases? Would it have an effect on total cost of care? Now, if you get that twofer, it's terrific for the patient. The insurance company gets a wonderful financial benefit because total cost of care goes down. And because it's all in the same structure, in the same fiduciary in our system, we can do the internal transfer pricing, getting some of that profit that would go to the insurance company back to the people who actually produced the change. And what we found, uh, and this has now been sustainable and it's spread way beyond those sickest patients, we found that there is about, in general, about a 20% decrease in admissions per thousand, which is significant. We also found that compared to the expectations for our cost curve, we were looking at, at about 7% about decrease per year, 7% 7, 7 decrease per year below our cost curve. We're, we're now below steady state. Now, if you recall during the ACA political run-up, the questions were whether we could get 1% out of our cost escalation over 10 years. And this is, this is 7% per year. So I, I, I don't think we're anywhere near uh, what we could do if any of this is generalizable. So here, here are the caveats. Most of the immediate effect in benefiting patients and decreasing cost is, is taken out of the hospital. So if you are a hospital-centric organization, you better have a business model to make up for the fact that you will have an effect on your volume. Your volume will go down, so you're either gonna have to build market share 
by stealing from others, or uh, you're going to have to have a different relationship to your payer, being paid not on the basis of widgets produced or units of work done, but based on probably getting some amount of that total cost of care delta that uh, has been created. Or again, you have, you have to backfill. The questions that you all will have to answer, I think, when you're, when you're out in the real world, uh, is, is any of this applicable anywhere else outside of our unusual market, our unusual sociology, uh, and our ability, because of the market share and the sociology, to do these kinds of interesting experiments? Is it applicable in a fee-for-service setting? In fact, our setting is a fee-for-service setting. There was an article in Health Affairs last month that basically says, even in a fee-for-service setting, this kind of stuff can be done. Are we going to be able to rely on CMS and on the changes which are built into ACA for Medicare and on the upcoming changes for Medicaid as our major partner to incent and catalyze uh, catalyze this uh, dramatic transformation of how we view care and population health. And I mean, my greatest worry is not the, not the, uh, uh, not the commitment, not the intelligence, not, not the uh, aspirations and the vision of, of folks who are working in, in HHS and, and in CMS. My worry is the, the accuracy and the timeliness of the data. The data has to be fed back almost almost real time, not quite, but it has to be fed back as close to real time as possible to the providers in order to change the kind of care for the patient that's in front of the provider at a given, at a given moment. So I think the market-based responses here may become even more important uh, than, uh, than, than CMS. I don't think, I don't think by and large that uh, November will make a difference in what I'm saying. It, it may make a difference in terms of Medicare Advantage. And that's probably a little bit too detailed to get into now. But I think that the fundamentals of the cost trajectory and the fundamentals of the, uh, uh, of the need to create value here are apparent to everyone. Uh, and, uh, and it will not be affected uh, in the intermediate term by the election. And I think the bottom line is we're going to have much more increasing demand uh, over the next few years. We're going to be monitoring uh, kind of the schizophrenic um, a standoff between the fee-for-service incentives and something else, uh, with whether it's uh, shared savings or quasi-capitation, uh, who knows. I think, uh, I think the real bottom line here is to increase value by re-engineering the care and then figuring out how to redistribute that. Uh, and I think we'll probably have either quasi-capitation or that plus uh, fee-for-service with decreased fees. And when I present this to hospital-based organizations, I say you do not want to be the hamster in the hamster wheel. That's a very bad thing. With fee-for-service, working harder to produce uh, more, uh, more services and having those fees go down, that's a bad thing. So next steps, national cost and quality metrics, absolutely critical. And they've got to be understandable both to the board of directors uh, of the organizations that are actually giving the care, and ideally they should be understandable to the population. The population has to understand where to get their care. Right now it's very difficult for regular human beings who are very bright to understand whether they should have their type 2 diabetes taken care of in system A or system B, and we've got to make that transparency a part, a part of our, our religion. I believe it's quite possible that uh, not only Massachusetts but others will have global budgets for Medicare and commercial, and they'll have to be both Medicare and commercial to avoid the cost shift. Medicare Advantage, depending upon the outcome, may or may not be expanded and focused much more on quality outcomes for reimbursement uh, benefit. And I think Medicaid managed care is going to be the answer that most states move to as we have a 16 million member expansion of Medicaid over the next few years. That'll be the single biggest payer expansion over the next few years. And I think we may very well be looking at price controls, which in my view work only temporarily, if at all, and regulatory commissions. We're seeing both of those things in Massachusetts, which as usual is a forerunner. There are multiple experiments in provider payer integration models 
Insurance companies are buying hospitals, they're buying doctor groups, doctor groups are buying other doctor groups, hospitals are now, hospital-centric organizations are now thinking about creating insurance companies again. And this is all in an attempt to create a different sweet spot where payers and providers can work together more or less like, like we've done for our sweet spot. And there's a huge amount of blocking and tackling, uh, I think, opportunity in this. Uh, in this uh, uh, in this tremendous uh, ferment, and and we're we're involved in 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 uh, some of that blocking and tackling, uh, trying to trying to tell people how to do the sociology, you know, the electronic health record, the incentives, and what have you. That's all pretty straightforward. You either do it or you don't do it or you modify it. But the sociology of actually how to change behavior on the part of our providers and on the part of our patients and, and members. If on the insurance company side is the key, and I think there's a huge opportunity. So let me uh, congratulate you. There's plenty to do. Uh, I've had the honor of working with one of the most um, interesting uh, organizations uh, over the last 12 years. It's not my work, it's their work. One of my directors is here, uh, Dr. Joel Mandel, and Joel and I will be happy to talk to any of you who are looking for a job as soon as we're finished this. So c congratulations, folks, and thank you very much for the honor of inviting me. <laughs>